I'm totally delighted to welcome you to our Fall Women in Public Policy Program Research Seminar Series. The Women in Public Policy Program at the Kennedy School equips leaders and change makers with rigorous evidence-based strategies for advancing women and gender equity. My name is Zoe Marks. I'm a lecturer in public policy here at the Kennedy School. I've been affiliated with and benefited from the WAP community uh, for many years now. And in gathering today, especially in light of Indigenous Peoples Day weekend, I wanted to offer a virtual land acknowledgement that honors local Indigenous communities on the land where Harvard University sits. If you are not currently based in Cambridge, I encourage you to look up the Indigenous occupants and inhabitants of the land where you sit. Harvard sits on the ancestral, traditional, and contemporary unceded homeland of the Massachusetts people, who are the de surviving descendants of the first people of Massachusetts and of the Neponset Band of the Massachusetts. The Women in Public Policy team are posting the link to our land acknowledgement in the chat, and we encourage you to all explore the resources in addition to reading the statement from the Women in Public Policy program. I would also add that there's an active and vibrant activist and research community around Native and Indigenous politics here at the Kennedy School and elsewhere across Harvard. This fall, our oh. seminar is exploring how gender researchers, policymakers, and practitioners can commit to strengthening the focus on intersectional research. We are exploring how gender intersects with other social identities, such as race, class, national origin, disability, political status, and sexual orientation. Our intersectional focus is not only addressing the unique experiences of people with intersecting identities, but it's also engaging with the systemic biases and oppressions that characterize intersectionality as a concept and related research. Many of the researchers that we're featuring in our seminar series this semester are also featured on our gender action portal, which is an awesome trove of research from our team here at WAP. They've collected research from around the world um, and highlighted specifically the work that's looking at intersectional dynamics. You can find this at gap.hks.harvard.edu, which I think will also be posted in the chat, I hope. And without further ado, I'm thrilled, honored, delighted um, to be meeting and introducing Professor Manisha Shah. Professor Shah is presenting new research on regulating sex markets, lessons learned and policy implications. As some of you know, this is a topic that I've taught in my own course on 21st century global feminisms here at the Kennedy School. And it's also a topic with which uh, we're developing a case study for teaching along with Professor Derek Cohen and the team at Slate. Professor Manisha Shah is one of the leading global researchers on the economics of sex markets. She also undertakes research focused on improving child and adolescent health and education. The goal of Professor Shah's research agenda is to identify more effective policies and programs to positively impact health and education outcomes globally. Dr. Shah is the professor of public policy at the, at the UCLA Luskin School of Public Affairs and the founding director of the Global Lab for Research in Action. She is an economist whose primary research and teaching interests lie at the intersection of applied microeconomics, health, and international development. Dr. Shah's work spans multiple countries, including Tanzania, Indonesia, India, Ecuador, Mexico, and the United States. And she has been supported by the Mil Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, the William and Flora Hewlett Foundation, the World Bank, and the National Science Foundation, among others. Dr. Shah also serves as the Faculty Research Associate at the National Bureau of Economic Research, also known as NBER, for those of you who follow these things, and the Faculty Affiliate for the Center for Effective Global Action. See, she is an editor at the Journal of Health Economics and Associate Edi Editor at the Review of Economics and Statistics. Now, as I pass it over to you, Manisha, um, I want to let our audience know that you'll be speaking for about 45 minutes, and then we'll have 15 minutes at the end for questions and answers from the virtual audience. So if you have questions, feel free to put them in the chat now or to wait until Professor Shaw's presentation is finished, but we ask that you not interrupt while she's presenting her research. So without further ado, I will pass it to you, Manisha, and my colleague, Anisha Asundi, will be uh, managing the Q&A at the end of the presentation. Thank you so much, Zoe, for that warm welcome. And I just want to make sure that you all can see my slides. Okay, great. So 
<clears throat> I, you know, I, I want to say it's it's a great honor to be invited to this very important series that you all are running on, you know, women in, in public policy. And I have to say a, a, a big part of my research agenda the, the past 20 years has been really thinking about how we can optimally regulate sex markets while sort of minimizing all the potential harms to sex workers but while also maximizing the welfare of all of us individuals in, in society. And so today, what I wanna do is I wanna give an overview where I will definitely talk a lot about some of my research on this topic, but I'm also, I, I, you know, I also just wanna generally share where we are in terms of like the state of the knowledge on this topic. So we'll also discuss some work written by, um, by other scholars. Before I get started, I, I definitely want to, you know, I have a list here of all of my various collaborators over the many years who have helped me think through some of these issues related to the economics of, of sex work. And I would also be remiss if I didn't uh, thank all of the sex workers all over the world who have spent a lot of time with me, sharing their stories with me and sharing their work lives with me. So, so thank you to, you know, to collaborators as, as well as sex workers. So before, before we get started, I just thought it would be nice for all of us to get on the same page about how I will be defining sex work today, because this in fact is, you know, we, we can talk about this at the end. There's some debate over what sex work is. I think in general, you know, in terms of public policy, I'm an economist in economics, we tend to think about it as the exchange of sexual services for money or goods between two mutually consenting adults. And so that mutually consenting adults part of it is important. Um, today, during my talk, I will mostly talk about sex workers in terms of like, you know, women are the ones who supply sex and men are the ones who buy sex. So males will be client or demand side, sex workers will be supply side. That's not to say that there are not, are not a lot of men who sell sex these days. And in fact, the kind of the MSM market, the men who have sex with men market has been growing over time. But generally speaking, um, you know, if we kind of look, if we look at the market globally, it's still generally women selling and, and men buying. It's of course very hard to quantify the number of sex workers engaged in the sex industry. I think you know some of the best estimates these days have been that there are about like one million sex workers in the U.S. And just to give you an idea, like a number that you know you all see female cashiers when you go to the store to buy things. So the the ACS estimates that there are about seven hundred and twenty one thousand female cashiers in in the U.S. Worldwide, of course, this number is a lot bigger. It's been estimated at 14 to 20 million sex workers. And I will say that anecdotally, we think that the sex market in the US has grown a lot during COVID because a lot of women who were traditionally like bartenders or servers in restaurants have joined kind of the online slash porn sex markets during COVID due to, to, due to job loss. Um, Again, revenue is something hard to quantify for obvious reasons, but for those who have tried to quantify it, you know, sex markets generate a lot of revenue, both in the United States as well as globally. So then, you know, in the US, we estimate it's around 15 billion US dollars annually and about $190 billion annually worldwide. So, you know, a lot, there's a lot of kind of money associated with, um, with this market. From a, from a public policy perspective, why do we regulate sex markets? You know, why is this something that we even care about? Um, I think historically, the, the big issue with regulation has had to do with disease transmission, right? We worry a lot that sex, work, sex markets are associated with higher rates of STI transmission, higher rates of HIV AIDS transmission. And of course, there's also all the other ne negative externalities that we worry are associated with sex markets, whether that be related to crime or drug use or violence against women or you know, housing prices decreasing. Um, you know, so those, so those are sort of like the, you know, the reasons, but again, I would be remiss if I didn't mention that honestly, I think one of the big motivating factors of like how we select which 
you know, which types of regulation to Im implement when it comes to sex markets really has to do with this issue of moral repugnance. And, and what I mean by moral repugnance in this context is that there's a lot of people who are really just offended by this idea that we can price sex and that we do price sex and that this is something we sort of have these, you know, public policy debates about. So I think morality is a key factor in what, you know, in the, the reasons that we sort of end up with with different regulatory frameworks. So this is just to give you an idea of, of how much variation there is across the world, right? So these red countries are countries that have criminalized or basically prohibit prostitution. And you'll notice that the United States is almost all red, except for Nevada. This is Nevada where, you know, there's a few counties in Nevada where we, um, where we have legal and regulated sex work. These green countries are legal and regulated. And, you know, a lot of South America, Mexico, basically much of Latin America is legal and regulated. Um, some parts of Africa. Uh, the other color I want to flag to you is this orange color, which is the, you know, the Nordic model or the end demand model. I often jokingly call this the sort of 21st century public policy of choice, um, because a lot of countries have been adopting it recently, even though there's very little empirical evidence on the impacts of, of these policies. So we'll, you know, we'll talk about this in, in a minute. And then the last color I want to flag here is these blue um, areas. So states in Australia, New Zealand, um, they follow this kind of decriminalized way of, of regulating sex markets. And so what I want to do in the 40 minutes or so that I have today is I want to talk through these four main types of regulatory frameworks uh, and, and basically just give you a sense of like where we are today with like what we know and also what we don't know. You know, for those of you on this call interested in doing research in these areas, there's just a lot of research that still needs to be done. All right, so let's start with criminalization. So criminalization, that you know, that's all these red countries that I, I just showed you. And, and the way criminalization broadly works across the globe is that you know, the countries, including the US, prohibit sex work. And the way that criminalization works, though, is important in that even though sex work is prohibited by law, generally, who's the person? Who are the people getting arrested and fined and harassed? It's the women, right? It's the female supplying. It's not generally the male buyers that the criminal justice system is going after. And I would say in, in, you know, in the United States, it often tends to be like majority brown and black women who are getting arrested for, for sex work in, in our country. And the idea behind criminalization is that it raises the cost of doing business, right? And it raises the cost of doing business because as a sex worker now, I have some positive probability that I'll get thrown in jail or that I'll get fined. And so on the margin, I might not enter the market because I just don't want to deal with that. And so the, you know, the, the kind of one of the motivations that countries criminalize is precisely to keep the market size down, right? The idea is we're going to raise cost to entry and we're going to limit the size of the market. And then the idea behind limiting the size of the market is like, hey, if the market stays small, then we'll limit things like disease transmission, we'll limit victimization risks, all these other negative externalities that we care about, like, you know, crime and violence against women. Because we're keeping the market small, we're going to limit those things as well. And more recently, some have also started arguing that, um, that criminalization decreases risks of, of human trafficking. And of course, you know, I think one of the big reasons we criminalize is it also addresses this issue of moral repugnance. Right. So for those of for those individuals who are kind of morally opposed to this idea of, of sex work, we're basically saying, hey, as a society, we're deciding we're not going to allow this type of behavior. OK. However, one could also argue, you know, this, I, I want to say this is a sort of a theoretically ambiguous question, and it really it's an empirical question, because one could also argue that the minute you criminalize, what you're actually doing is you're pushing this market underground, right? It's not that it's going away, it's that now you're pushing all these women who used to sell sex openly underground. What happens when you push things underground? Well, behavior becomes more risky and it becomes more risky precisely because women are now less empowered to say, hey, you've got to put on a condom or they're less empowered now to call out a client who might be violent against them because who are they going to call? They're going to call the police who will then arrest them, right? And so 
One could actually argue that things like S disease transmission would increase under criminalization or the risk of sexual and physical violence from clients actually increases and that the you know, victimization of sex workers by, uh, by police is actually increasing. And in fact, you could also argue that the risk of human trafficking will increase precisely because you've pushed this market underground. And so all these sort of bad apples in society now can operate much more openly underground than they could you know, in, in the sort of uh, decriminalized world. And so really this is an empirical question, right? You could argue things both ways, you know, I, I'm an economist. I say, let's bring this question to the data. Um, we were working in East Java in Indonesia for, uh, for many years with sex workers. And um, in fact, you know, I want to tell you about this paper, which we recently published in uh, your university uh, journal, the quarterly journal of, of economics. And, and basically what we're able to do uh, is we're able to exploit a natural policy experiment that happens in East Java where we were already working. And, you know, it's nice that I get to talk about a, a policy experiment given our the sort of recent news with uh, the three Nobel laureates in, in economics who have really pioneered a lot of this work. And so we, we, we do something similar in that we were working, let me just show you this map. We were working in these three districts in Indonesia, in Malang, Pasiruan, and Batu. We were actually about to implement a random control trial with the universe of sex workers in these three districts. We were going to do a savings experiment with them. So we had baseline data on all of them. We had collected amazing information on all of them. We were about to run our randomization when the mayor of Malang basically announces like, hey, as a present to the district of Malang for Ramadan, I am going to shut down all of the brothels. Now, you know, this region of East Java historically has like an amazing, healthy, thriving sex sector, and it's actually a very domestic sex sector, unlike Bali, which, you know, has a lot of international um, clients. And so he basically decides to shut this down. We scramble because the NGO that we were working with basically said, hey, we can no longer do the savings experiment and work with these women in Malang because, you know, we don't want to be engaging in kind of illegal activities. And so we pivoted and we decided, let's try and follow all of these women over time and see what happens to the women who, you know, who were working out in the open in Malang. They now become criminalized. Like, what are the impacts, right? What happens to them? And so we decided to follow all of these women over time. And then what we're able to do is implement a nice, you know, difference in different strategy where we're just going to compare what happens to the women in Malang pre and post criminalization relative to all of the sex workers in Batu and Pasiruan who don't face any change, right? And so the, the findings I think are, are really fascinating. So one, I wanna to talk to you about this question of like market size, right? So when you criminalize, what happens to the market? So this, this dot here is pre-criminalization. We were working with about 550 sex workers in these three districts. You'll see, and this is dotted line is criminalization. You will see that post immediately post criminalization, you see this decline in um, the women working at these criminalized work sites. So this is about a year time. We go back in 2019, four years later, and what you'll see happens is four years later, we are back to the exact same population size of sex workers that we were at, you know, prior to criminalization. But what has happened now is these women who used to be working in these, you know, nice, regulated, safe, healthy brothels are now working on the street, you know, in other places. Basically, they've sort of gone underground, right? And, and or they're still working in the same brothels that were criminalized, but they're kind of working in these gray, shady areas. And so what we're able to do is we're able to look at a lot of outcomes. We look, you know, we tested these women at baseline end and line for sexually transmitted infections. And what you'll see is post-criminalization, um, women at criminalized work sites are about 20 percentage points more likely to test positive for an STI. That's about a 56% increase in STI. So that's a huge jump, right, in, in STIs. The main mechanism we find is it's really a story in, in Indonesia about condom use. 
So prior to cr criminalization, all of these brothels used to work with like the local Ministry of Health and with NGOs and they would get access to free condoms and free health checkups. And it was a very sort of, you know, a, 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 a nice way in which these brothels operated. Criminalization happens, you no longer have collaboration with the local Ministry of Health, you no longer have any collaboration with NGOs. And so what happens is, you know, women basically are less likely to be getting health checkups. They say now it's significantly harder to obtain condoms. Um, at baseline and end line, we ask them like, hey, do you have a condom on you? Can you show it to us? You notice that, you know, in these criminalized work sites, women are 50 percentage points less likely to have a condom on them at the time of survey. They also report now it's much harder to ask clients to put on condoms compared to before. Um, and, and you see that, you know, there's about a 16, 17 percentage point increase in, in transactions with no condom use. We also interviewed men for this study and, you know, men are reporting very similar things that now in these criminalized areas, they're significantly more likely to be engaging in, in non-condom sex. And so what does criminalizing do? Criminalization actually is increasing STI risk. So, you know, going back to kind of our theory, in fact, empirically, we're finding increases in STIs. Um, a lot of this is a, a lot of the story for these women is about condom use. Um, but we also, you know, we, we collected a lot of other data on these women. And I want to mention that women in criminalized sites, like their income significantly goes down, their happiness significantly goes down. In low income countries, the majority of sex workers, you know, anywhere 80, 90% of these women also have children. For many of this, these women, this is why they're doing the work is because they're supporting children. Um, at Endline, women in these criminalized sites report that their kids are less likely to be in school and more likely to have to be, you know, helping work to sub supplement household income. Um, so, the, you know, these are all the impacts on the sex workers. We also do a sort of epi some epidemiological modeling to say what's happening as well to the general adult population. And, um, you know, and, and kind of unexpectedly, we find that because of this increased risk to sex workers, that also translates to the general adult population uh, in, in East Java. And so, you know, this was like a very micro study with amazing data, but what I want to say is our findings are very consistent with a recent meta-analysis that was, you know, conducted by Platt et al who kind of concluded that criminalization does in fact increase the risk of sexual and physical violence of, you know, to sex workers from clients. You see increased police violence, abuses of power, and basically that you see a lot of displacement of these women. And in fact, that displacement to isolated work locations um, really just has a lot of, you know, differing negative impacts on, on these women. All right, so that's sort of the, I would say kind of where we are with the bottom line on, on criminalization. I wanna say a few things now on decriminalization. Um, and in fact, many of you on the call, I'm sure have, have probably heard, there's a lot of talk about decriminalization in the US right now. I think there's been a bill introduced in New York, Washington County has actually decriminalized. We're talking about it in, in California as well. And what this basically is, is, is just the removal of criminal penalties for sex work, okay? And so it's still illegal to be a pimp. It's still illegal to own a brothel. It's still illegal to engage in human trafficking. But what decriminalization means is that we're going to stop enforcing laws against sex workers and we will stop arresting women. And so the, the kind of theoretical prediction here is that should lower the cost of entry. Um, and, you know, you probably one of the things people worry about with decriminalization is that the size of the sex market will grow, right? It'll get bigger. And then again, all these things we worry about, like disease and crime and et cetera, that all of those things will sort of get out of control as well. All right. And so what do we do? We, we actually, um, this is some of my earlier work with Scott Cunningham, where we, um, we were again able to exploit a very interesting natural experiment that happened in Rhode Island in 2003, um, where basically a district court judge read some old case law that was written in the like late 70s, early 80s. And when that case law was written, it was actually street 
you know, sex work that was the big public policy pro problem, right? So in the United States, we've had this interesting transition from kind of street sex work to primarily like online sex work these days. And so this case law actually prohibited street sex work. It said nothing about indoor sex work. And so for this like period of six years in Rhode Island from 2003 to 2009, you have this nice period where until they can kind of rewrite law and recriminalize indoor sex work, you have this period of six years where indoor sex work in Rhode Island is decriminalized. And so we, again, we exploit that natural experiment and we look at various outcomes of interest to kind of compare Rhode Island to the rest of the US where there's no policy change to see um, what happens, right? And, and so, you know, the, the first thing we kind of look at is, hey, do you actually see a decrease in arrests in Rhode Island for sex work? And, and we do find that. So we do, you know, and we did a lot of qualitative work for this study as well, where we interviewed a lot of police basically saying like, yeah, we had to stop arresting these women because during this period, there was sort of, you know, there was no law that we could use to, to go after them. So you see a decrease in arrests. You do see that, you know, so the Providence Phoenix is this, this again, this is back in the day when people actually used to use newspapers to, you know, advertise. Um, so pre kind of the big online market. So the Providence Phoenix was like this weekly uh, local paper where sex workers would advertise, you know, their services. And so what you see is kind of post decriminalization, there's just like a huge increase in the number of new ads, right? So there's a lot of new entrants into the market. And then this red line here is the total size of ads. And so what do I mean by that? Basically what we see the change, so this is pre decrim, this is spa Midori, which was kind of a big popular spa back then. And post decriminalization, what you see is like these ads just become a lot more blatant blatant and big. You know, we, we had hired this RA who sat there in a library like measuring ad sizes for us, but like the ads just become like bigger and more blatant and there's just a lot more. So, so there is entry. All this to say, like you do see the size of the market in Rhode Island increase um, post decriminalization. So then our next, you know, question is, hey, what's happening? You know, we're, we're kind of interested in, in, um, in uh, disease, right? So what happens to things like gonorrhea? So gonorrhea is a nice measure of res risky heterosexual sex. And so what you'll see here is this dark black line is, um, is Rhode Island. And this, this dotted line here is when they decriminalized and basically, in Rhode Island, during this kind of six year period of decriminalization, you'll see that gonorrhea incidence decreases relative to what I'm calling here synthetic Rhode Island, which is, you know, the synthetic control here is made up of other states in the US. So there's about a 40% decrease in gonorrhea in Rhode Island during this period, which is amazing. I mean, that's a, you know, pretty significant decrease. And what we find is, you know, we use a lot of data in this paper, but we do find that during this period, sex workers are engaged in less riskier sex. So they're more likely to use condoms. They're less likely to engage in anal sex. Um, and, you know, and, and so it does look like there's, there's safer, safer transactions um, happening. The other outcome we were interested in was, um, was reported rape offenses, right? We wanted to look at this issue of violence against women, because again, one of the things that people have argued is that when we decriminalize, there's a lot of entry and then there's just a lot more violence against women. And so we looked at reported rape offenses in the US and this is using um, uniform crime reports data. And again, we find something really interesting here, which is basically this black line again is, you know, Rhode Island and our dotted line here is synthetic Rhode Island. And during this period of decriminalization in Rhode Island, there's about a 30% decrease in reported rape offenses um, against women in, in Rhode Island. And so again, we're, you know, we're finding that the data is suggesting there's actually a, a decrease in, in violence happening. And kind of while we were writing this paper in Rhode Island, there was similar work happening in the Netherlands around, uh, you know, a different policy experiment where the Dutch government basically decided to, um, to create tipple zones, where tipple zones are these areas where street prostitution is legally allowed. 
And, and so what they do in this study is they look at the impact of, you know, what happens when the Dutch government is creating these tipple zones. And what's really interesting and what was sort of exciting for us is they're finding very, very similar results to what we find in Rhode Island in that there's about a 30 to 40% decrease in sexual abuse and rape that women face um, in, the, in the first two years of, of this policy. So overall, you know, kind of where we are, I would say, in terms of state of knowledge of, of decriminalization, you know, th there's definitely been some debate over whether or not the market size does increase. You know, we show that it does in Rhode Island. Others have kind of debated about whether or not, you know, how much it increases. And I think some of that depends on where you are at the baseline, right, when this change happens. Um, but I would say the overwhelming evidence right now on decriminalization, kind of including our work, the work in the Netherlands, there's also some, you know, other work I'm not going to have time to tell you about. But really, the kind of overwhelming evidence has been that um, you know, population STI rates decrease under decriminalization, and a lot of these outcomes that we care about related to violence against women are also decreasing, and that, you know, some of the, these, you know, again, these crimes that we often think of as affiliated to, to sex markets are actually decreasing. Um, and, you know, if you talk to someone in New Zealand, you know, New Zealand decriminalized a while ago, they, they would say, well, of course. Um, but one of the problems, one of the things that made New Zealand hard to study is they decriminalized all at once as a country. And so for, in terms of causal analysis, it's always hard to think about like, hey, what's a good counterfactual or what's a good control for, you know, for New Zealand because the entire country has, um, has decriminalized. Okay, so in the last um, 15 or so minutes that I have, I want to talk a little about both the Nordic model um, as well as legal and, and regulated model. So the, the Nordic model is often also called the end demand model. I've also in New York recently heard it being called the equality model. Um, I, I sort of jokingly told you, I often call it the like the 21st century public policy of, of choice. I've also read that it's being considered the best practice internationally for, um, you know, for regulating sex markets. And, and I would, um, and let me, you know, before I get on to what it is, let me just put in my two cents, which is I don't know why this is happening. Um, because I would argue from a research perspective, we know very little about this model. You know, this model was adopted in um, 1999 in Sweden, which is why it's called the Nordic model. And then Norway, Iceland, they quickly followed. Um, but, but more recently, you've seen Canada adopt, France adopt, Israel adopt, um, Ireland adopt. Uh, so, you know, you're seeing a lot of European countries quickly adopting this, this end demand model. What is the end? Of, and I should also mention, I've heard that a bill has been proposed in New York City or in New York as well to, um, to adopt end of demand. So the idea, end demand is sort of similar to criminalization, except now, as opposed to going after the sex worker, you're criminalizing the buying side of the market. Okay. So you're basically, you know, potentially arresting men, you're fining men, you're sending men to prison for buying sexual services. A lot of the literature on the Nordic model is, um, you know, it's actually written by feminists and it really sort of poses sex workers as victims of, you know, kind of a large capitalist system and clients as oppressors, okay? And so the idea though, very similar to like, you know, criminalizing the sex work side of the market, the idea with criminalizing the buyer side is again, that we should decrease the size of the market, right? And that women kind of shouldn't be selling sex. And this is like a market that we basically want to see disappear in some sense, right? And so, I myself have not done empirical work on this model, but I want to talk about two interesting studies that are out. So this paper, this is Marina de la Justia and her co-author. So this paper was just accepted at the Southern Economic Journal where they, they're looking at the United Kingdom over time because the UK over time has become, has started adopting like this end demand model and they've started kind of going after clients and then, you know, stop going after sex workers. 
What's really interesting, and so they kind of look at this question like, hey, is it the fact that we're quashing demand, right? When we end this, when we kind of adopt this end demand model. And um, and they don't find any evidence for this. So they use various waves of the British National Survey of Sexual Attitudes and, and Lifestyles they don't actually find that there's declining demand, but what, what they do find is very interesting, which is the composition of demand changes, okay? So the type of men who buy sex once the end demand model comes into, you know, into the world is they become more risky, okay? And so again, like from a public policy perspective, it's not clear to me that we want to be shifting demand from kind of like, you know, your average guy buying sex to just having risky clients end up in the market, because I'm sure you can all imagine what happens when riskier clients start buying sex. Okay, so that's kind of, you know, interesting paper number two. Interesting paper number, sorry, interesting paper, that was one. Number two that I want to flag. So this is um, still in, in working paper format. And this is uh, Ricardo Siachi has this paper where he's looking at, um, you know, the the, oops, I'm sorry, I'm trying to get this out of my, you know, the title is Banning the Purchase of Prostitution Increases Rape Evidence from Sweden. So the, the finding is right there in the paper, but he's basically, he's looking at what happens in Sweden from 1997 to, to 2014. And what he does is he estimates the impacts of these fines that get issued on men, right? Because this, system comes into play and then men start getting fined when they're caught buying sex. And so he looks at that, what happens um, to these fines over time on rape. And what's really interesting is he, find that he finds that for every, you know, for a one standard deviation increase in fines, um, rapes are increasing by about 13%. Um, and, and, you know, he has some other interesting findings in this paper that I, you know, that I want to flag. So one is that he's finding that sex workers now are switching towards pimps. You know, again, from a public policy perspective, that is not what we want to see. Like, we think that's probably likely happening because what pimps do is pimps help protect women and pimps help identify clients. So in this world now where it becomes like harder for women to find their own clients, they're going to start using these pimps as either intermediaries to help them get clients. There's all sorts of negative effects, though, that pimps have on sex workers and you know, in fact, there's been a lot of research done that unfortunately, I'm, I'm not going to have much time to tell you about, but basically like trying to understand how the internet and online sex in some sense has gotten rid of intermediaries like pimps and made sex work a lot safer for women. And so when we're in this world where there's public policy kind of, you know, getting women like back to using pimps, um, that's something we need to start worrying about. The other thing that I think is really interesting about this paper is he actually finds that after this policy comes into play, there is um, an increase in Swedish sex tourism to places like Thailand, basically lower income countries. And so what's happening is like men who used to buy sex in Sweden because, you know, it was legal and they were allowed to are now deciding like, hey, I'm going to get on a plane and fly to Thailand where I can, you know, buy sex. And so again, it's not clear to me from a public policy perspective is that if this type of displacement of, you know, purchasing sex is, is something that, that we want to be encouraging. And so overall, you know, as I mentioned, there's not um, there's not a lot of research on, on the end demand model, but like everything I've seen using data it suggests that the end demand model is not really having the, the sort of impacts that I think people are hoping they will have in that it's not actually decreasing demand, right? You're seeing an increase in sex workers working with pimps, which again, is not something that, that's sort of safe for women. You're, in Sweden, we've seen that rape is actually increasing. We've seen cross-border displacement of demand for sex work. We've seen in the UK an increase in you know, the risky clients. And so my, you know, my one point I would make is these are two case studies from Sweden and, and the UK. We need a lot more research on this, but um, I say this because I, you know, I'm a bit concerned that so many countries are, are kind of quickly adopting this policy um, in a world of, of very limited, uh, limited evidence.
All right. So the, the last framework I quickly just want to touch on, which is a lot of Latin America, is this idea of, of legal and, uh, and regulated sex work. And, you know, one of the problems with, um, with doing research on legal and regulated sex work is that generally speaking, a lot of countries, you know, they may have legal and regulated sex work, but the way they regulate sex work is very distinct from like the next country. And so many of these, um, many of the impact studies are kind of much more country specific, but I would say generally speaking in the world of legal and regulated, we're in a world where, you know, women can sell sex, but there's some sort of licensing and or registration requirements or zoning requirements um, that they need to comply with, okay? And so often it's some sort of occupational license where you become a legal sex worker if you have a license certifying that you're healthy, that you're STI free, that you're HIV AIDS free. Um, you know, Nevada has a similar system where they have a lot of, you know, testing and health checkups. And I would say, um, you know, let me say a few things about this. You know, I've done some work on this in, in Ecuador. There's also some nice papers uh, in, in Senegal looking at this. And, and my read of the literature is that in a lot of low income countries, what happens with this system of regulation is that it's very costly to women because in most low income countries, we don't have this kind of nice national healthcare system where like all healthcare is subsidized. And so what ends up happening is a lot of women have to bear the costs of the testing and the checkups and it's quite costly for them. Unlike a place like the Netherlands, the tipple zones, you know, maybe they have some like registration requirements there, but in general, like the government is paying for a lot of the like health services that, um, you know, that they need to engage in. And so I think one of the things that has happened in low income countries where sex work is legal and regulated, you know, I definitely saw this in Ecuador where I was working is, is there is substantial non-compliance with the, you know, the, the regulation requirements because they're costly. And so what that can can do is it can create this underground market of unlicensed sex workers, um, where, you know, indoor sex workers may shift to this unlicensed market if they just can't comply with some of the costs of, you know, of keeping their license updated, etc. But I will say on average in these kind of legal and regulated systems, you do see that sex worker health is, is better. And it's, you know, it's probably better precisely because um, they are doing these regular checkups and getting tested and and, um, and so I guess, you know, I would say for those places thinking about reg legal and regulated, like how sex work is regulated and who bears the cost of a lot of that regulation will really determine, you know, what some of the impacts of that legal and, and regulated system uh, look like. And, you know, I, I should mention some of the work that was done in Senegal also showed that, you um, that the sex workers felt like there was a lot of stigma associated with this system because they were sort of then like publicly identified as being sex workers. Um, and, you know, for a lot of women, this is something that they do on the side or quietly, or, you know, it's not something that women publicly share, especially if they have like women or, you know, family members that, that they live with. And so that, I guess that is another kind of potential cost of, of this type of regulation is that it does like publicly identify you in some sense. Okay, so let me just say a few words now before um, before I need to wrap up. So, you know, if I, it, I often get asked this and I used to hate, uh, you know, as a researcher, you sort of hate to make real normative statements as, as I guess as an you know, economist, we always like making a lot of positive statements but it's hard to make normative statements. But if I was to kind of look at all of the evidence that exists on these various regulatory frameworks and kind of tell you where, I, you know, what I thought the like kind of best policy response, especially for like a country like the United States where we, you know, generally do criminalize sex work everywhere still. Um, my sense is the best policy right now is, is decriminalization. That's really where we've seen kind of the most positive impacts. Um, on all, you know, a whole range of, of, of very different types of impacts. We, we've seen really kind of positive impacts there. 
Um, with sort of, you know, one of the concerns sex workers often say is like, hey, if we go the decrim model, we're not far off between them moving to kind of legal and regulated, right? Because once we decriminalize, kind of the next step could be that we need to figure out actually how to regulate this market. And there, I would say there's still a lot of open questions about like, how do you effectively regulate um, sex markets? And, you know, ha happy to kind of chat about that. Um, let me, I just want to say, sorry, to, um, before I, I wrap up, I, I you know, I, I want to wrap up now, but there's a lot of research that needs to be done. And I think one of the things I want to say as I'm wrapping up is there's still a lot of debate on the impacts of any of these regulatory policies on human trafficking. Um, and part of the problem is that we just don't have good data on human trafficking to be doing a lot of the serious research that needs to be done. Um, but I think that's an area that, um, that we definitely need to think more about. And then, of course, there's just been, you know, I, I talked about the end demand model, but recently, especially in the US with like FOSTA, SESTA, the sort of there was the FOSTA, SESTA shock, and then there was the COVID shock. And so there's just been a lot of kind of anecdotal evidence that the sex market has changed a lot in the United States. And, um, and, you know, we just, we don't really know a lot of what's happened in this kind of uh, post COVID world. So with that, let me stop talking and, um, and thank you all and, and open this up for questions. Perfect. Thank you so much, Professor Shah, for sharing your really important research on a community that I think has been historically underserved and undersupported. And I really, really appreciate your rigorous empirical lens on this as well. Um, so now we're going to move into the audience Q&A. If you have a question, please use the raise hand feature, which should be under your reactions tab. I will unmute you. You should get a pop up on your screen that'll say the host is asking to unmute. Um, and then you'll have the opportunity to ask your question out loud. Um, so I see Dara has the first question. So Dara, Anisha, I'll ask you, you to, to unmute now. Stop, should I stop screen sharing now? What's the... Sure. Yeah. If you want to stop screen sharing, just so we can all see each other. Yeah, that's what I... Okay. Let me do that. Thank you. All right. Perfect. Mm -hmm. Dara, it's over to you. Um, great. Thank you so much. Um, I'm just such a huge fan of your work, um, and it's really such a delight to hear you talk about all of your pioneering research and how you have studied these questions in such, uh, such a rigorous way. So thank you so much for, for coming to our talk. Um, my question is kind of where your talk ended, which mm -hmm. is that based on all the research that you've done and that others have done that you summarized for us today, it really seems clear that the, the best evidence suggests that criminalization means kind of worst, outco worst outcomes for all of the populations that we care about, right? Um, both the sex workers themselves in terms of disease and violence, and also in terms of the broader community. I was really interested in the findings about children and the wives of the clients and the community and that sort of thing. So my question is really about politics, which I think is a little bit of an unfair, unfair question for a political scientist to be asking an economist, <laughs> um, and maybe in the realm of questions that um, you, you uh, don't like to answer, as you were saying towards the end of the talk. But I guess when I teach this, some of this material in my class at the Kennedy School, some of the questions I get from students and pushback I get from students is about this, which is to say, how, how do we explain why all of this wealth of evidence, which points pretty clearly in one direction, has not been digested and acted upon by our policymakers? Does it have something to do with the kind of moral repugnance issue that you were referring to earlier in your talk? Um, but as a as a professor in a policy school, you know, we teach our students that evidence based policy is the gold standard and policymakers should be guided by the best available research. So can you say something about what the roadblocks are in this case and what might it take to overcome them? Yeah, I, that, this is a great question. And thank you so much for asking it, because it's been something that's been very frustrating for me, you know, in that I really started this work purely as a researcher and I've never, I've never felt that comfortable kind of going into activism or whatever, but I, I in a way I sort of naively thought, well, if, as the evidence base keeps growing, well, you know, the policymakers will kind of look at the evidence base and um, it hasn't happened. And about two and a half years ago, I would say this is precisely why, you know, I, I sort of with uh, my deputy director, Janine, we actually founded the Global Lab for Research in Action. And I would say 
part of the reason we founded this lab was because I came to this realization that this research and action piece doesn't often come from people like me, even though like I'm doing the research, it's not getting out as much as I would like to the people who actually need to be hearing this, right? And, and I would say like, since the lab has come around in the past few years, like I've done events with district attorneys across the US, you know, we, we definitely engage more with like policy maker types, but it's still, I mean, I will say it's still frustrating because in New York, for example, like the end demand model is being seriously considered right now. And when I hear things like that, I'm sort of like, wait a minute, all of the evidence for the end demand model is terrible. Like, why are you even, <laughs> you know? And so part of it is like, how do we, you know, we've been sort of partnering with like decriminalized, you know, various organizations. Um, but I think one of the big problems is that this is one of these markets where people just have very strong preconceived notions based in like their own moral compass. And so it's often hard to shift people's views on these things. Um, but I, you know, I often come back to this, like, it seems like we have in some sense with marijuana, right? Like, I never thought there would be a day where like, I would be living in a place where I can walk down the street and kind of buy marijuana legally, right? And so it has been done. <laughs> <laughs> the question is like how how we make it happen. And I think part of the problem, at least in the US, I'm, I'm going to be like perfectly blunt here. You know, I've always considered myself a feminist. I think I'm a feminist. I get a lot of hate mail from feminists now. And I think part of the problem in the US is the feminist movement has really splintered into the like decriminalize and the end demand. And there's a lot of really vocal, strong, savvy feminists pushing for the end demand model. And in a way, I feel like they've actually done a much better job organizing and, you know, getting out there, which is why we've seen these countries like Canada and France like adopt these policies, um, you know, because maybe, you know, maybe there's something sort of politically easier to be like, hey, you know, we get that we've been criminalizing women and arresting poor women. Now we're going to go after the men, right? I think that's like an easier political message um, to sell to, to people as opposed to like, hey, let's just stop going after the men and women. And if they're two mutually consenting adults, let them decide what they want to do and if they want to pay for sex. And, you know, I think that's like a harder message to, to sort of push. Um, so it's, it's yeah. <laughs> It's it's been a huge source of frustration for me. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you both so much. Um, do other folks have questions? Please feel free to raise your hand or if you'd rather pop them in the chat. Oh, I see Morgan has a question. I will ask to unmute you now. Be quick um, in case others have questions, but I'm just to acknowledge what I put in the chat. There are two bills to fully um, decriminalize and also enact an end demand model in Massachusetts right now. And it's clear that um, I'm in, involved with the decrim MA coalition, and it's clear that we're being outfunded and out um, lobbied by the end demand group. Um, but this information, I think, will be actually extremely helpful to us. Um, they have their own research um, and it feels like there really has just been like a dearth of us um, of what we can pull on. So um, I just just to thank you for this, um, because I do think at least in Massachusetts, having this in our toolkit will at least be one additional thing that we can use because they literally always articulate like we have the data, we have the numbers, but they don't use citations ever, which is um, yeah, I, I think, thank you, Morgan, for that comment. It's a great comment because the other thing I was going to mention is unlike a lot of other areas of research, I think one of the problems with like research on sex markets is that there's just a lot of really, really bad research out there. I mean, again, I'm going to be perfectly honest here, right? A lot of it is done by activists who kind of already have a point that they're trying to push. And then they'll write these papers that, you know, again, in any academic circle, we would be, you know, say this isn't research, but it really gets out there. Journalists pick this stuff. But I mean, here's the other problem. I think journalists, honestly have not always done us a favor in terms of like how they've like sold these studies and these findings. And um, so, so yeah, it's, it's been, um, you know, as, as somebody who kind of does 
and it was more focused on like careful empirical research. There is stuff out there, but it's figuring out, you know, and filtering and making it, making sure that it's getting into the right hands up to the, to the right people. Perfect. Thank you, Morgan, for sharing that as well. Um, Zoe has a question. I'll ask you to unmute now. Thank you, Anisha. And I'll try to be quick so we can get one more in. But um, Manisha, one of the things that I've heard from sort of more radical but still end demand aligned sex workers and sex worker organizations, I would say, is um, really just that the the decrim policy doesn't do anything to move vulnerable girls and historically oppressed groups of women. As you said, in the US, it's black and brown women, but it's different groups in other countries out of the sex work market and into you know, dignified labor or jobs that they might want, or even just like protected healthcare and access to education. And given that that's what so much of your broader work is on, I was curious if you could kind of share whether there's any new research that's going in that direction about this sort of like, is there a way to change the composition of who is, you know, economically coerced into sex work? Right. Um, since that seems to still persist under the decrim model. Yeah. I mean, so I think I feel like there's two, you know, the, the, this economic coercion, obviously under the decrim model, model, if you're a minor, that's still illegal, right? And so if you're sort of talking about more economic coercion of adults who, you know, for me, I guess as an economist, I would say it's that you have no other outside option, right? You're sort of doing this because like, this is the best thing you can be doing given your skill set and kind of the money that you're making doing this. Because I will say, you know, and again, this is something that sort of I've collected data on globally. On average, sex workers make a lot more money than the average woman that looks like them, right? In terms of kind of education and skill set and et cetera, et cetera. So it's sort of a good living minus, of course, all the huge risk factors that you know you you need to account for. And we could actually argue that that's probably why they make so much money is because it's a very, very risky job, right? And so there needs to be some sort of compensating differential that they're taking home because they're engaging in in so much risk. And and so I won't disagree with you there. You know, I think like labor market market opportunities for like low income, poor, uneducated women in this country and in most countries are, are terrible. But I, to me, that's sort of a different policy question, right? In that um, my sense of like, if you talk to most black and brown women in this country who sell sex, you know, the first thing they would want is for police to stop going after them, right? Because in some sense, like until you can get out of the fear of being arrested for the type of work that you're doing, you can't really even focus on like, what else should I be doing? And one of the problems, again, anecdotally that I've heard from them with the end demand model is like, sure, now you're no longer arresting me, but you're arresting my clients. <laughs> and so like, if there is going to be this period of transition, you know, maybe for some women, which is, I, hey, I want to do something else, like the, the sort of negative income shock to them when you're arresting, you know, their client base it's not as bad as arresting them, but it's almost as bad, right? And so to me, I feel like there's sort of, you know, again, I'm, I'm gonna really simplify things, but there's kind of two groups of women, right? There's the women who are engaging in sex work and wanna keep doing this and this is their job, right? And they're happy to be doing it and they just wanna be left alone and they wanna do what they need to do versus like, of course, there are other women who are like, hey, I'm doing this. I love other job market opportunities, et cetera. I would say for either types of these women, the end demand model is not like, you know, where we should be going. The decrim model much better because at least you're saying, hey, we're gonna stop arresting you and we're gonna give you the space to figure out like what you wanna do. And like, I 100% agree we need to figure out labor market issues for women like globally. They are terrible right now, especially with COVID and, you know, but I, I honestly feel like that's just another, that's another issue that is not necessarily something related to kind of how we regulate sex markets, right? And I, I sort of, to me, I see those as, as two separate things. Great, thank you both. Um, I think we have time for one last question and I see Rachel's hand is raised. So Rachel, I'm gonna ask you to unmute now if you could ask your question. Hi, um, thank you so much for your talk. I'm currently doing sort of like writing a paper on um, like gendered welfare states. And um, this might not be an area that you can really speak to, but I was interested in like 
in countries where they're adopting the fourth model of sex work, have there been different approaches to like folding sex workers into the welfare state in terms of like pensions or like other benefits that, you know, workers get from the state? Because I feel like my instinctive response would be that they should be folded into the same way as other workers. But obviously with moral panic, I feel like that might impact, um, I guess, like the benefit that they get from the state despite being registered and regulated. Yeah. So I think, you know, my sense is there's like good evidence of this in places like New Zealand, where, you know, and in some northern European countries as well, where sex workers are, in fact, you know, a part of like the welfare system. And um, in I think, you know, in the US, for example, this has really come to light during COVID when, again, this was all anecdotal, but many sex workers were sort of like, hey, we don't, you know, we don't qualify for a lot of this government assistance that's happening right now due to like job loss or, um, and, and again, I'm going to tell you all this anecdotally, but because I have now worked in so many countries with like very different regulatory environments, I would say kind of on average, like in countries where sex workers do, you know, are kind of folded into the welfare state and get access to health care and access to unemployment and access to other welfare benefits, um, they just seem to do better on average. Um, you know, and, and again, I don't think that it's terribly surprising. This is, you know, this would be true of, of sort of anyone. And I, you know, I, I'm an economist. I've always, to me, I sort of view this is a job, right? And many women across the globe will be like, hey, this is what I do for a living. And it's not clear, like, why I don't get access to the same benefits that other, you know, employees do. And, and so, you know, again, I, like my sense, my prior, I think some of the research out there does suggest that, um, kind of it's it's better for for women. I will say though in the US like you know when we talk about kind of in a, in this world where we to decriminalize and then we sort of think about what would what would it look like if we were legal and regulated, right? Like one thing that often comes up in these conversations is, you know, I'm always like, hey, you guys would have to start paying taxes now, right? And, and like that's it's an interesting question, right? Because when you do get folded into the welfare system, that also means that you're paying taxes, and you know, and this is something that sex workers in many countries are not doing, and you know, the the sort of take home pay is their take home pay if they're not sharing it with like pimps and brothels, and so those are the types of conversations that would have to start shifting as you know as well and so and you know and some sex workers aren't clear that they you know want to kind of go that route I think there's a lot of heterogeneity of course depending on like where you are and who you're talking to there's so much more energy in this conversation. Thank you so much, Professor Shaw. I hope that you've had a chance to download the chat because I'm sure you couldn't read it while you were dropping knowledge for all of us. But um, thank you for bringing all of this insight, the wealth of research that you've done to help us better understand and serve um, women and all sex workers, not just in the United States, but around the world. Thank you to all of our participants, those who uh, listened, those who joined the chat, and those who asked a question.